encourage you, if you didn't get a verse sheet, please take one. I find that as I get older, my, my fingers don't work very well. And due to the fact that I look up um, usually a good number of scripture, I would waste so much time trying to find the, the page that I find it easier to print the verses out. And the first book I'm going to read from is Genesis chapter 7. But that's going to be about halfway through the message, so you can kind of warm up to Genesis chapter 7 if you want to. This is my fourth message associated with the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God, I believe, is a very big subject, and I want to continue along that line this morning. Now, my message should be on Father's Day, but... You know me that I'm never in phase with the holidays, so John McQuarrie, it's his fault. He's the one that does the scheduling. Never schedule me for a, a nationally recognized holiday because I'm probably not exercised to speak on that. Now, it's not that the role of the father is, is unimportant or is the mother. Uh, it's due its recognition, but my most important thought is that we live and behave as our Heavenly Father. The verse I'd like to leave with you with respect to this is 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, printed on your sheet. It says, and now little children, you see that applies to all of us. Here, God is speaking to us. Now little children abide in Him, that when He shall appear. We may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. You know, this ought to be the goal of, and the prayer of every father and mother here, that our children abide in the principles of God. Not that I shouldn't pattern a life that they should emulate, but it's much more important that they walk in the good graces of God the Father so that they're not ashamed of him when he comes. I can remember uh, being at home at 753 South Chautauqua. The parents were gone and, and us kids had gone up in the bedroom to uh, be bad. Hmm. My, my bedroom was upstairs. Rob's bedroom was upstairs. And so we were bouncing around on the bed and guess what? Oh, we had a company over. And this company kicked the wall and kicked a, a three-foot-long, two-foot-wide panel right out of the wall. And oh my goodness, we heard the parents drive up. <laughs> we were really, we were in trouble. So you know, we can do good things, we can do bad things, but most of all, we should emulate our Heavenly Father. That ought to be the prayer and the goal of everyone here. So today, I want to continue with ourselves under the sovereignty of God. We have used two verses as kind of our focal keys, both in Romans. The first verse there is Romans eleven twenty two, which says, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. On them which fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness. If thou continue in his goodness otherwise, Thou also shall be cut off. This verse shows to us the unlimited boundaries of God's sovereign working. From goodness to severity. From the east as far as the east is from the west. Between those boundaries is the sovereignty of God's working. And then Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are called according to his purpose. Now the all things are our earthly experiences. He says all things. This is where we're at today. This is a situation where you are experiencing today. All things work together. Now the things that, who works them together? It's God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That word there uh, work together. I'm going to speak to my son since it's his first time here. He goes to 
to uh, Sunrise Bible, Community Bible Chapel. And he's a speako Greek, but you know the word right there, check it out. Uh, work together is that word where we get our English word synergy. Synergy. That is, several things come together and they make and produce a, a sum total of something greater than just one singular thing. And so it says, we know that all things, all these sovereign things work together because the synergist is God the Father, the Son, through the power and working of the Holy Spirit. God's sovereignty energizes and defines those experiences. Now the last message I attempted to see, to have us see, to believe that we are individually under the scope of God's sovereignty. Sometimes we as human beings, even believing human beings, some have this false idea that the only ones that were really recognized as being in the sovereignty of God were the big champions of faith. And we, we look up to those people and the scriptures give us those people so that we might look at them and learn from their lives. But aside from that, I want to try this morning, if I can, to persuade everyone who's listening to the sound of my voice, and that includes me, you are just as much under the sovereign graces and experiences of God as anybody that ever lived. Amen. And if you don't believe that, if you think somehow that your experience is lesser because of who you are, or who you're not, I want you to think again about that. We are all under God's sovereignty. Now, my last message, I attempted to do this by going to the book of James, chapter 2, verses 21 and 26. And that reason I did that is because it paired two people. One was Abraham, and who was Abraham? Well, Abraham, Naomi, as you know, Abraham was the father of the of the, the, the Jewish people. Abraham was a progenitor of, of the earthly descendants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Naomi, Abraham was considered and called the friend of God. Now, how special is that? You see, I could never be an Abraham. Well, it's interesting that James chapter 2 pairs Abraham with someone else. The Canaanite, Amorite, Harlot, Rahab. Mm -hmm. You say, oh, how low can God go? Somewhere I trust that you might understand what I'm trying to convey is that somewhere we are, each one of us individually, in the sovereign workings of God, and that means something in his purposes. Don't throw yourself away because you're not in the Bible by name. Everything that happens to us has to do with the perfect, wonderful, beautiful purposes and will and glory of God. And I want to talk about that more this morning. So considering these extremes, Abraham to Rahab, might we believe that God is dealing with us? Each one one of us individually and also that we are an important as a part of his purpose and will. So today I want to again use the story of Rahab, but I want to notice another element of God's sovereign dealings with us. That element is time. T-I-M-E. Time. I want to mention here just a, maybe a personal note about time. You know, I feel that in my own life, my most misunderstood of God's dealings with me involved his timing. His timing. You know, if God is sovereignly in control, and God is good, and it's for the good purposes, why does something happen in my life and all of a sudden I'm, I'm out on a limb and I'm waiting? Sometimes I feel like I'm a, 
you know, a firefly on the end of a twig hanging over a, a little brook, and there's a big tadpole looking up at me, just waiting for me to drop in. And I say, Lord, why don't you rescue me? Make my wings work, you know, quit lighting my light up and help me escape out of this. And God does. But he does it, you see, in his own time. You know, I, 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 I don't want to wait for an answer. Why doesn't it come according to my own logic? Do you ever feel like you know better than God? No, we would never admit that. But sometimes isn't that the way we live and our expectancy inside is God just is ignoring me. You know, puzzling things happen. They have to do with God's timing. I don't want to mention here, I don't want to make someone feel bad, but uh, this is the current example. My son David, he lost his job February 26th. What is today? The day is June 16th, Father's Day. He has a job, he hasn't a start date. I'm not going to mention, I'm not going to say anything about it because if he ever decides to tell this experience in the sovereignty of God, it's going to be his words, not mine. But for a parent, I'm puzzled. I said, Lord, I, I can't understand that. I can't see that. Take, for example, Nick Lambers and Jordana. Who would ever think that Nick would have an operation and three months later he's still recovering? And in the meantime, Jordana discovers and has a rip in her diaphragm and can't even hold her own child because of the weight limitation. And so who would ever thought, why now? Why, why, why doesn't God just, you know, snap and, and her diaphragm is healed? Everything is perfect. He's got his own job back. The insurance is paid for everything. Who would ever think that someone traveling to Germany back and forth would break a bone in their foot? <laughs> you know, who would ever think that they would leave Germany and not get home to the United States for almost 24 hours, waiting in Tulsa for a storm to pass? You know, God's timing, you see, is very, very to understand. Oh, it's easy. So easy to declare my, my fidelity to God when every turns out, everything turns out to be according to my logic and my understanding and my wants. Oh, you know what I like? I like a Santa Claus God, don't you? I like that big Santa Claus in the sky that just swoops down and it gives me every good thing that, you know, that I want and candy and everything's happy and everything's cheerful and bright and smiling and everybody's singing and it's not been exactly my experience with God. When those things unexpected, I say, how did the blue happen? I'm not talking about a case where someone ignores good sense. Suppose someone says, you know what? I, don't, I, th I think I could jump off the Eiffel Tower. Well, you better wear a parachute. No, I, I can do it. God's sovereign. God's in control. I'm just going to take it a flying leap, and off you go. Guess what? Hopefully, don't ask me to take your funeral, because it's not going to be the best message, probably. You know what I mean? Or you say, I, I, I think I'm not going to pay any, any income taxes here. I'm just going to stick it in my pocket. Oh. And then you beg God, oh, listen, please don't throw me in jail. Please don't penalize. You know, I'm not talking about something like that. I'm talking rather about what most would call providence. The unsaved would call it, well, it was just in my cards. Or it was in my stars. You know, it was my horoscope said this, and I was going to have bad luck for the next six months. Oh, you know, my luck. Oh, my bad luck. I don't believe it. And worse yet, someone might say, I believe God's mad at me. And that's a very frequent response. 
I'm not speaking of normal. I am speaking of those normals, but unexpected trials. And the why God answers, and in his own T-I-M-E, his own time. I believe without a spiritual sense and understanding and acceptance of God's timing, we fall prey to Satan's deception and many lose faith in God. Many step away from the God that they receive salvation from because God did not respond in the way they thought or according to his time. Sovereign God. What comes to your mind? Well, Genesis chapter 18, verse 14, just the first phrase I printed, is anything too hard for the Lord? Does anybody here think anything is too hard for the Lord? Raise your hand. Well, no, nothing's too hard for the Lord. He who could split the stars and the Milky Way into space and create Everything out of nothing is anything too hard for the Lord? Well, no. But now let's read the rest of that verse. Genesis chapter 18, verses 13 and 14. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I by surety bear a child which am old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Now notice carefully, at the time of appointed I will return unto thee according to the time of life Sarah shall have a son did you notice there are two mentions of time here's sovereign God and what does he key the experience that Abraham and Sarah had on time two times you know from Genesis chapter 12 verse 2 when Abraham was first promised that his seed would propagate down all the way to Christ until Isaac was born was 25 years. <laughs> Did you see why Sarah laughed? I could join her. 25 years. And remember Abraham had he, tried, he said, God must have forgotten it. And Sarah said, well, I know how we can abrogate the, the timing of God. You know, I've got a handmaid, and you know the rest of the story. Notice those two increments of time, God's appointed time. It was his time appointed, and according to the time of life, two times he mentioned time. Well, today, God's sovereignty and time and timing. Let's go back to the account of Rahab and kind of story eyes that very quickly. You know, remember that there were two spies from Israel sent to take uh, to when they were going to take Jericho. And one of those spies was Caleb. I love that name, Caleb. I just wish we had a Joshua here so I could tease Caleb and Joshua, but that's a good name. You know, if you ever had, well, you know, probably, probably you know, Caleb, uh, Joshua's a good name. Anyway, so two spies were sent from Israel into uh, uh, the coast of Jericho there, and this Canaanite harlot, Rahab, she hid him on the roof. She said, I know you've come from God. She said, I'm going to hide you up on the roof. So she covered him with straw, and of course the, king, the king's men came and, and were looking for him, and she lied and said, no, they've already gone. I don't even know where they went. So when the, the uh, constables left, the sheriff officers left, what? Well, she told them and they went the other way and so she was spared. Now, I want you to notice the why of this. There's something interesting. First of all, she believed God and based on what she observed, I believe that was her conversion. Notice I printed Joshua 2, verses 10 and 11. Notice these verses. For we have heard, she heard this, how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of you, and Sion and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt, 
neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For, and get this, the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and earth beneath. And that's when I believe Rahab trusted the Lord. Faith cometh by hearing and salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when did this happen? She said, we heard how you dried up the Red Sea. When did that happen? Forty years ago. Can you imagine the people in Jericho sitting there going along like this right here? Are those Israelites coming? Well, it's been one whole year. It's been two, two years. It's been 10, been 12, been 18, 20, 40 years? Can you imagine that? Now I want you to consider another verse, or two or three, from Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 through 16. Verse 13, and he said to Abram, no other surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not there, and shall serve him, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterwards shall they come out with great substance, and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. You understand a little bit of math? That God actually gave the Canaanites and the Amorites a minimum of 420 years plus another 40 years while Israel wandered in the, de in the wilderness, he gave them 460 years to repent. All that time, God was trying to get them to repent. And here we have Rahab, and she's only sensitive the last 40 years. Now, he says the Amorites, the iniquity, the Amorites is not yet full. Keep that in your mind, not yet full. God was waiting for their repentance. 460 years. How many souls were saved? Well, initially there were four, and then remember Lot's wife looked back. She turned to her son and saw there's three. Three people saved. 460 years of God's sovereign timing. You know, there's another verse. Pardon me, I got, I got the wrong thing. 460 years of how many people were saved? I'm thinking a lot. How many people were saved? Rahab and her family. God's sovereign time. Another verse to hold in your thinking is from uh, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. And we've seen this verse before. And it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but as long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so here again, I want you to notice in particular time, God's sovereign timing in relation to the number of souls spared. How many? It was Rahab and just her family. Think about that. God waited all that time and only Rahab the harlot and her family that was with her in the house only they were spared consider Noah how long did Noah preach during the ark preparation we don't really know but it says in Genesis chapter 5 verse 32 Noah was 500 years old when his sons were born now he took his sons on the ark Genesis 7, 6 says Noah was 600 years old when the flood came. Well, that's at least a minimum of 100 years. How many souls were saved? 100 years of preaching. 
100 years of demonstration of the ark being built. I don't know how long it took the ark. It might have only took 10 years. I don't know. Those people were pretty smart back then. 100 years. How many souls were saved? Eight. Do you see some correlation now that I'm trying to get to? Is the timing of the sovereign God in our life and what he has in his mind according to his eternal purpose. What about Sodom and Gomorrah? In Genesis chapter 18, when those three personages at Christophany came to Abraham, and God told Abraham, he says, I will go down now to destroy Sodom. Zero time. God says, I'm going to do it now. In Genesis 18, 23, then Abraham asked God, he says, will thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? God, you sure you're not going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? And, and you know, he then begins to intercede for Sodom because, of course, his, his nephew was there, Lot was there. So he says, God, he says, if there's 50 righteous, will, will you destroy Sodom? God says, no. Then mm -hmm. Abraham says, well, suppose there's only 45. We destroyed the Lord God says, no. Abraham thinks again, well, maybe maybe there's just 40. Maybe I got a little too enthusiastic. Maybe for 40, you wouldn't. Would you destroy it if there's 40? <laughs> Long suffering God says, what? No. <clears throat> Abraham said, oh, you know what? This is easy. God, if, if there's just 30 there, would you, would you destroy it if there's 30? 30? God says, no. Abraham, you know, begins to come to himself and he says, well, God, he says, I bring this up again. He says, don't think me forward, but he says, suppose if there's just 20, would you destroy all of Sodom for just 20 souls? God says, no. And Abraham comes before God, the friend of God, and he says, God, if there's just 10 souls, would you destroy Sodom, if there are ten souls there righteous, God says no. Mm -hmm. How many souls were spared out of Sodom? Initially, as I said earlier, four, and that went down to three. How many years had Sodom been in existence? Well, from the time of the Tower of Babel, and I believe that it started right after that time. The Tower of Babel was about 2250 B.C. Sodom was destroyed in 2065 B.C. That's 185 years. Three souls there. You get the sense now of the long-suffering of God and his timing. And what about our lives? As we evaluate what happens to us, when we don't see things come our way and in our time, do we shake our fist at God and say, you just don't care? Mm -hmm. What about Nineveh? That great Assyrian city, and we heard about this uh, several weeks ago or months ago now, David brought a, a message on Jonah. And about 762 B.C., a very angry Jonah preached to the inhabitants of Nineveh and all of them repented. 600,000 people repented. But guess what? In the next 150 years, that Assyrian city would be destroyed by Babylon and the Medes. 150 years later, in 612 BC, all of Nineveh died. 150 years earlier, all were saved, 600,000. 150 years later, all were died. How many souls were there? They estimate that Nineveh at that time was 7 million people. Not one of them saved. God is sovereign. He owns time. The question is, will we submit to him? and have faith in him, and trust him in all of our circumstances. God is the architect of time. 
Now I want you to notice something from, from Genesis chapter 7 and, and, and chapter 8. I'm going to read these things. If you're there, you can follow along, but I'm going to try to read these quickly. Genesis chapter 7, verse 6. Does God pay attention to time? Listen to this. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters came. Verse 10, and he came to pass after seven days, the waters of the flood were upon the earth. Verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. Verse 12, and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Verse 13, in the self same day entered Noah, Shem, Ham, and Jephthah, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife unto the ark. Verse 17, and the flood was 40 days upon the earth. Verse 24, and the waters prevailed upon the earth in 150 days. Genesis 8, chapter 3, and the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of 150 days, the water abated. Verse 4, and the ark rested in the seventh month, and on the seventeenth day of the month, upon Ararat. Verse 5, and the waters to cease, decreased continually until the tenth month. And in the tenth month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountain seen. Verse 6, and it came to pass at the end of 40 days, no open the window. Verse 10, chapter 8, 10, and he stayed yet other seven days. Verse 12, and he stayed yet another seven days and sent forth the dove. Verse 13, and it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. Verse 14, in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dry. Let me ask you something. Do you think God knows time? Mm -hmm. Do you think God is precise? I believe so. And therefore, we need to, if we live and understand and exercise faith in God, we have to be sensitive to the fact that he knows timing exactly. Mm -hmm. Split second timing. Consider Galatians chapter 4, four verses 4 and 5 of Jesus coming, the incarnation. But when the fullness, oh, here's that word again. We saw it earlier, didn't we? But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Look at that. But when the fullness of the time was come. Jesus Christ was precisely born at the time of God's sovereign plan. Not a second too late, not a second too early. At the fullness of time, at the precise time, Christ was born into this world. Okay, here's my first guess what? Guess what? The second is coming. Is on its way. And we don't know the time, do we? It says in Matthew 25, 13, Watch therefore, for you know neither the, the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. This refers to Christ's literal second coming at the end of the tribulation. <laughs> Nobody knows that time, but guess what? It's coming. Oh, guess what again? Here's guess what number two. The rapture. Huh. When Christ returns to the air and clouds and catches up the church, oh, when is that time going to be? Oh, we don't know. You need to listen to my brother, Dr. Rob. Guess what he's going to say? He's going to tell you precisely the same thing. We don't know. <laughs> he's also going to mention that we're, I think he's pretty close to God. And so we think about God's timing. How many here would own up to having prayed for the rapture to have occurred at one or two, three times in the past? Raise your hand. How many here would say you prayed for the rapture to come? The Reds do. Oh, I read the power. Oh. Yeah. Well, um, how many here would, would pray that he might come to? <laughs> but you know what? 
told me if I prayed 15 years ago for the Lord to come and he did, how many souls would be lost? Do you understand that? If I'd have prayed for the rapture to have occurred, say, 37 or 8 years ago, I believe our brother Jim Lyndon would, would have missed being saved. Do you understand what I'm saying? You see, if delaying the day by one day, how many more souls would be saved? How about if we delay it by one week or one one month? Or listen, if, if there's more souls going to be saved, let's, let's let's just keep it going. Let's just have let's just never have the rapture happen. Let's just. Do you see the dilemma? I'm not sovereign. I'm not that synergist. I can't see all the things and for his purposes. And so we leave it to come for God and for the Lord Jesus Christ, our precious bridegroom, to come at that appointed time. I'm so glad it's not up to me. Therefore, we need to have complete confidence in God's criteria and time. Now you notice previously when it came to that verse about the Amorites that sin was not yet full. Christ was born at the fullness of time. Now at the rapture, I think this verse refers to the rapture, Romans 11, 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that the blindness in part has happened to Israel until the what? The fullness of the Gentiles who come in. And then Luke 21, 24, which I believe refers to the second coming. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. We don't know when that's going to be. The fullness of time has not been fulfilled. Who feels that fullness? We you listen to my brother's latest message and you understand the fullness of God. He was waiting back, way back in the days of Genesis before Rahab was even born for 400 and some years. He says the iniquity, the sins, and all the disgusting things that were going on had not been full. In other words, he was long-suffering. Mm -hmm. He hadn't come because he was waiting for them to repent. Guess what? This is guess what number three. And I think, Mark, you better call my brother Rob. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Number three. There's another coming of Jesus. Yes, there's another coming of Jesus. First John chapter 5, verse 12 says, He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. You see, when we put our faith and trust in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we believe that when he was crucified on the cross, God took all of our sins and put them on Christ, and Christ paid our debt. He died. That was the penalty of sin was death forever. And Christ, if you believe that, when he died, he took your sins away and believed that he rose again for your justification. The Bible says you will be saved. And guess what? Christ will come into your heart. You can't stop him. You don't even need to invite him. If you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and believe that he died for you in your sins and accept the fact that his blood washed you white as clean, you can't keep him out of your heart. Guess what? That particular coming of Jesus can occur right now. Where you are, where you sit, you can receive him as your Lord and Savior. I trust that that coming you will experience today if you can do that. My closing verse, verses, I should say, Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. These verses address fathers because it mentions man. 
and it also mentions the sovereignty of God. Jeremiah 9, 23, 24, Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. Does that sound like you fathers? But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. Fathers, do you get the message? That I am the Lord. And what does the Lord do in his sovereignty? Notice, I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For these things I delight, saith the Lord. I trust this morning that you see yourself in the sovereign workings of God. And you accept by faith and trust and leave the timing up to him. What a hard thing to do. But we are called upon to express trust and faith in the sovereign God that works for our good and for his glory. Father, we come here now and we thank you for your word. Father, we pray as usual that you would strike the words of man and that the words are issued forth by the Holy Spirit would remain in the hearts and the ears of all who have come this morning. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for salvation. And Father, help us who have put our faith and trust in him to acknowledge him in all his ways, in all our ways. Help us by faith and trust to accept your timetable, Father, for we know that you are long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. Father, be with us now and then. 